Hey, I'm Derek. And I'm Noah. You're listening to A Bite Of. Where we take our current favorite pop culture obsession and enjoy it one nibble at a time. Look at us making puns for Percy Jackson every time we do it. Oh. Current. Current. (gasps) Guys, the pen ultimate episode of season one. Because I believe there'll be a season two. I don't know why it's not been announced, but penultimate episode. Yeah, how could, how? How has it not been announced yet? Because of this. They want us to want it. And it's working. It is working. They know what they're doing. <laughs> Look, so they know working. what they're doing. <laughs> we have uh, a lot to talk about. We're going to the underworld. There's a lot that happens there. Oh my God. So much. Yeah, this, this has flashbacks. It has present moments. It has people mentioning their past and their families. A lot happens in this episode. A lot. Before we get into this episode, make sure you're um, giving some stars, doing a little review, subscribing, following, whatever it says on the app, the plus button, if it doesn't say anything. Uh, do all those things because uh, you'll get alerts when we do new episodes. We have some really fun stuff coming up. Uh, recently, we went to a screening at the Universal Studios for Argyle. Uh, so we have that episode coming out next week and an interview. Can't wait. Very exciting. <laughs> yes. But we must first indulge in this penultimate episode. And before we do, give you all a spoiler alert. Because spoiler alerts are nice. And that's the least we could do. <laughs> So let us officially take a bite of Percy Jackson and the Olympians episode seven. We find out the truth, sort of, directed by Anders Engstrom and written by Andrew Miller. Presty presses Percy to put his head on a pillow, but Annabeth pushes him instead. The trio travel to the land of the dead, where they root for Annabeth in the forest. Grover takes an unexpected flight and Percy uncovers a deceptive plan in the underworld's upside-down home of Hades. <laughs> so good. That was really good. One of your uh, very uh, top, top. We should, like, write all these down and post them. Yeah. That'd I mean, fun. if it's, I always, I always feel like if we were to ever put all these little things up, it would be like a Cliff's Notes to what all the episodes are about. We did that with um, our very first season. When we did Midnight Sun and we did every chapter summary that you wrote and we put it up there. And I'm not even kidding you when I say it is still to this day, years later, our number one most visited page on our website. I, I, the, I'm sorry to mislead everybody to actually think that you get chapter summaries of like a 600 page book. It, it is kind of. Yeah, right. Because those are even like one or two lines. They're not even that much. Yeah. And I wonder, like, what is someone searching for? Midnight Sun chapter summaries. That's it. And it just comes up. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what is this? This They're probably so hopeful where it's like chapter by chapter, like, oh, finally. And then they get to it and they're like, what is this nonsense? (laughs) It's just your face. (laughs) Okay, so we are one episode away from the finale. How did you feel about this episode? How are you feeling? Oh, gosh. I'm feeling like I... I'm trying to figure out where they're going to go from here. Because in this episode, they definitely switched some stuff around. They added some things. And so it's like, I feel like in our final episode, they might switch some things up. I'm not saying major plot points, but I feel like maybe we'll get some more mystery, some more questions, and maybe see more of relationships than we thought we would. Yeah, I am really hoping they have a good opportunity here to really set up the next season and the series itself. They could really end this any way they can uh, or want to. And it was a lot. This episode had a lot packed into it, mm. which is typical for penultimate episodes, the episode leading up to the finale, because it's so much story to tell in an episode of a show. And I think they did it really well. They, they made it naturally flow to all of them. And I like the changes they did, because if they didn't, you know, going from, you know, crusties to then the record shop, which was the, the entrance to the underworld and the thing. It's just it just didn't make sense for them to go to like building to building. Right. So I like some of those changes, but I'm very excited. I think this is one of my favorite episodes of the season. So spoiler, I really like the episode. <laughs> um, it was strong, very strong. The flashback parts were like 
oh my God. Yeah. I'm, so good. One of the things that we've spoken a lot over the journey of this season is the depth that they, they have been adding to the characters. Because as we've said in that first book, it really is just such an introduction to the world of Percy Jackson. And so we're kind of just skimming the surface of the characters, of their relationships, and even I feel like of some of the mythology. Whereas here, we're diving in deeper. And, you know, for example, meeting um, Hephaestus, you know, we, we didn't meet him in the first book. It gave mm-hmm. depth to the entire tunnel of love thing. And here we really got to see so much of Percy as a child with his mom and even the God coming and sort of being a part of it, but not necessarily. So Poseidon. Yeah. Okay. I was like, which God? We saw three gods in this episode. (laughs) Very true. I I just mean with Poseidon. So like, those are things that we didn't get. So Mm -hmm. they're really kind of fleshing a lot of this stuff out, which I think is a really great idea. Yeah. Uh, And so I think sometimes, though, when you're fleshing those things out, you have to make decisions about, well, okay, this is the skeleton that we had. What are we going to remove from it? And I think that they still added things that people would be looking for, right? It's like, are we going to get the red rubber ball to distract Cerberus? We did. Mm -hmm. It didn't exactly happen like it did, but this is an adaptation of the book, right? And Mm -hmm. I think I liked the interaction with Cerberus in this one. So Before we get to the underworld, because I feel like that's going to be a big chunk of this conversation, can we talk about one of the things I was so excited to see in the show? We, when we covered it in on our episodes talking about the book, I loved Krusty's Waterbed Palace so much, and I loved it. I loved this. It was it was quick, but I liked that there was no like. Oh, what's happening? What's going to happen? Blah, blah, blah. They already knew what mm-hmm. was happening. It's the entrance to the underworld and they know that Procrustus or Crusties puts people in their bed to make them fit, even though nobody ever fits in these beds because they're like six, seven feet long. They don't fit. Nobody's that tall. Give a good stretch. I mean, yeah, nobody's really that tall. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that kind of caught me by surprise is when Percy Firks walks in and he says, I know who you are, Procrustus, son of Poseidon. And I was like, wait a minute. They're brothers? Yes. You don't remember. I had a whole thing when we covered the book. And I said he in in the mythology, because I don't think they said it in the book. No. But I said in the mythology, he is a son of Poseidon. It's not like confirmed nor denied, but it's like he's supposed to be. And he tries to put people in iron beds. And that's how he kills them. Right. He chops so, them up. Yeah. And so in this one, they he just... The, the sheets, I guess, wrap up into them. Um, it's I, just water beds. You well, know? I I did like that we got different types of beds, right? Because that's what's <laughs> described in the book. There's like a tiki bed <laughs> yeah. and then this bed. And so each of the beds that is kind of lining the wall of Krusty's is a little different, is designed differently. And I like to think, depending on the one that you go into, it kills you in a different way. <gasps> Fine. Right? Because this one, that the headboard was shaped very much in a way that two axes or razors or blades would come out. So I, I would have loved to see what the other beds could do to you. Mm, like the, the jungle theme one, it was like vines that would come out or something. Yeah, mm. totally. Did you see a waterbed that you would like? Mm. You know? There is a correct answer. No. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> None of them. No waterbeds <laughs> ever because they're deadly. I, I, you all know my feelings about waterbeds. If you don't, I don't like them. Um, and especially Krusty's waterbeds. They don't seem fun. But <laughs> the betrayal of Krusty was so good. He green suit, fantastic. Um, him slapping the waterbed. Mm-hmm. I just was like, this dude is creeping me out in all the right ways. I literally have a note here that says, slap that bed, baby. Yeah. <laughs> that that took us both. I think we both took notice of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, the surprise of Annabeth being invisible the whole time. I pushing him on there. No so idea that was coming. So good. Yes. So, so good. They're really utilizing the cap in fun and smart ways mm-hmm. in the series. Mm-hmm. And the um, only other thing of note that happens here is Annabeth giving Grover the squeaky ball as a stress ball. I did want to say, so I'm still trying to figure out Grover as a character. And so... I'm I'm kind of wondering, like going along with his his vegetarianism or veganism, we're not sure if they were almond milk milkshakes or whatever at the diner. But I'm also wondering if he's a pacifist as well, because he stays outside 
And he just pops his head and he says, is it over yet? Well, I think he just couldn't be invisible. Mm. <laughs> Cause I, uh, I mean, I don't think he's a pacifist. Like I think at least I'm not sure in the show, right? In the books, he very much like, he doesn't necessarily fight, but he does things with his reed pipes, which he doesn't have in the show. Which I am just now realizing where's his reed pipes anyway. So he can do like wild magic or nature magic with the reeds to like get people and, mm. you know, consume them into trees and stuff like that. So it is interesting, right? It's like he hasn't directly fought right in this, but he doesn't necessarily shy away from it. Like, I think he understands it's part of the journey. Yeah. But he doesn't partake. Got it. He'll help. Yeah. Not partake. It's like he could have walked <laughs> in with Percy. Right. Like they could have come in together being inquisitive and asking about it, but right. he didn't. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Good point. Just a thought. We'll see. Grover yeah. has a long journey ahead of him. And I'm glad that at least in the show, we're seeing a little bit more of him. Right. We're mm -hmm. seeing like some scenes where we he's by himself and interacting with people. But also seeing how goofy and funny he is because he's still there's a line in here when we get to Hades Palace. He has like the best one liners in every episode. So good. Mm -hmm. uh, Aryan. Chef's kiss. Yeah. So good. Nailed it. Uh, flashback. Mm. Let's talk about the flashback. Do you want to do the whole flashback? Or yeah, pieces? why not? Let's do the whole <laughs> flashback. Um, good. I, I okay. like <laughs> wait, but I still cannot get over. How much Azriel Salman, who plays young Percy, looks like Walker Scoble? He looks just like him. It's wild. Yeah. It's so wild. Yeah. And he, he, you can tell, too, that he kind of has some of the same mannerisms. Like, yeah. I, if, if you would have shown me a picture of him before the show, and it's like, here's a picture. Who is this? It's like, oh, yeah, it's young Walker Scoble. Mm -hmm. It's not. But, mm -hmm. like, looks so much like him. Yeah. Perfect casting. Um, any episode and any screen time. That Virginia Kroll as Sally Jackson, favorite. She kills the role so good. It's She just has this way of like showing how much love and pain and how hard it is to not only have a, a, a child that is difficult, right? But the decisions that she has to make. And seeing this now fleshed out um, flashback, because we saw it when he, Hermes touched Percy. Mm -hmm. Seeing what that meant is pretty upsetting. And I, I think that she has an interesting role here because she's not only playing a protective parent, but she's playing a protective parent that has to keep a secret from her child. And you can see how that kind of tortures her because she wants to be able to tell him why she needs to do the things that she's doing, but she can't. And so... To her, I think it feels like she is basically lying to him and almost not really being able to fully show herself to him. There's two specific quotes in this uh, flashback, if you put them together, um, that really stand out with the importance of this scene. So she tells him when he's like, I'm not going to go, I don't want to go. And she tells him something like, sometimes I have to make decisions you might not understand. And that's like the nicest way you can tell a kid that like, even if I told you the truth, you're either not going to believe me or like, you're just, you're too young. You're not going to understand. I'm the parent. I have to make these decisions, even though I don't really like these decisions either, but I have to make them. And that's why she's trying to take him to a school that's outside of the city, a school that's supposed to help him. Do you think that the reason why he didn't get in was because somebody like Electo or something sent those things to that school? To be like, don't let this kid in to like bring him back to the city. That's very interesting. I didn't think of that. That was my first thought. Cause like, I mean, why would a teacher go out of their way to like be like they drew crude, you know, drawings and it was just a picture of a Pegasus, you know? Yeah. It almost seems like that's such like, so you're going to fault a child for having an imagination. That's what it seems like. They don't like fun. Yeah. <laughs> But even so, I mean, that seems to be the reasoning, but maybe there was some mythological things that were going on there mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So because of his past incidences, he's not allowed to go to the school, which sucks because now we know the course that his life is going to take where every year he goes to a different school because these incidences continue to happen. Mm -hmm. I love that um, to make him feel better because he's not in the school or allowed to be in the school. She takes him to the diner and gets him a Sunday. And everything. So, you know, it's less like you heard everything that was happening. Let's just like go to the diner. This is 
probably why I know I'm not a son of Poseidon or at least related to Percy, because if you were to put little Derek in front of a Sunday like that, there'd be no Sunday left. Mm-hmm. Whereas he's too depressed yeah. and he can't eat it. <laughs> he doesn't eat all of it. I would yeah. have been sad and I just would have been like, Arr. the, um, sorry to segue to a sadder line, but oh. the, the second line in this that was like really important is like, he tells her, why are you trying so hard to get rid of me? I would never do this to you. Then broke me because like, he doesn't understand. And like to think about it in his shoes, it's like, Everybody thinks something's wrong with me. I think something's wrong with me. Now my mom probably thinks something's wrong with me and wants to get rid of me. And let's even look like flash forward a second, right? So he says, I would never do this to you. And then he has to make the decision to not save her. Mm -hmm. When his whole life, he has said to himself, I would never leave her if I had the choice. And then here we are. Where he has the choice and he has to do it. Where he literally has to make the choice. Yeah. Oh, so good. I mean, this is, it's such an important thing for the series. And I'm loving that they're setting that foundation between Sally and Percy so strong in the first one. Because going forward, depending on how many seasons we get, it's going to be a very integral part. Mm. And I like that it's being done this way. And the added thing of now we get to see Poseidon and Sally. So this is one of the things we knew was going to happen from the interviews. We heard that like Poseidon and Sally are going to have a flashback scene together. It was really good. Well, first of all, I just love the nod to making an offering. Mm -hmm. So she lights a match and she basically burns the ice cream. She knows the tradition. She She knows the rules. I mean, what is that conversation? If you ever need me. Light some ice cream on fire and I'll be there. Well, I don't think it was specifically <laughs> ice cream, but lucky it was ice cream and it like put out the match. Yeah. She's not know? starting a fire inside yeah. the diner, but I also love that once she does that and it starts to rain and then he comes in. So that actually makes me wonder. So it was, I don't know if like every time he makes an entrance, he likes to cause a downpour. But when she, when Percy comes home from Yancey, and she finds his mother, she's outside and it's raining. So do you think that she called Poseidon and talked to him about this? I think that is such a good point. And it makes a lot more sense to why she was sitting outside in the rain, probably with that music on so that nobody could hear nobody could hear her having a conversation with him. Did we figure something out? <laughs> Becky? <laughs> <laughs> Leave Becky alone. <laughs> but she's like, guys, I can't do everything every episode. <laughs> that is such a good, good, good right? theory, Noah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Cause Definitely. I, I mean, it's, I think it's really important for this scene and for Poseidon and the relationship between what Percy perceives, lots of peas, and what's actually happening. Right. So mm. Percy grew up thinking his dad wanted nothing to do with him. He abandoned them, yada, yada, yada. And we as viewers and readers, until this scene or until things that happen at the end of the book, you're kind of thinking like, yeah, like kind of an asshole, like forget whatever deal you made with Zeus for where you can't, you know, have any more children or interact with them or whatever. But now we're seeing he did want to be a part of his life. He did want to help, but he knows he can't. Yeah. She, she says something to him. I don't know if this is an exact quote. I want him to know who he is before your family tells him who they want him to be. That's exactly what she says. So good. That's super powerful. And he respects that. He He, understands what she's saying. Exactly. He lets her make the decision because him being a God, he could be like, I'm going to take him away from you or like, you have to take him to camp or whatever. She's the one that says, I want to take him to camp. And I think he realizes that if you take him to camp, you're not going to have this relationship with him or it's going to be different. Right. And he's so young and we see later in the episode, there's the whole thing about like, we're not in Kansas anymore. And I think this is super important because in the car, Sally says, we're not in Kansas anymore when they're outside of that school. And Percy has no idea. And she's like, Oh, did I never show that to you? And in the underworld, when they first get there, he says it. And Annabeth is like, yeah, we were in Kansas like two days ago. So you can kind of see if Sally 
didn't keep Percy, mm-hmm. it would have been like Annabeth, right? Where he missed out on all these things that she loves and that she would have shown him. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's like, it's such a very smart callback and like a through line between these two. And I also think that for the longest time, we all have been thinking that Poseidon has been a deadbeat dad, but in reality, he loves them so much. He's willing to respect Sally and what she wants for their son. And you should, because she's a fantastic mother. She died for him? <laughs> she got frozen for him. Okay. Uh, she didn't know that was going to happen. That, that is very true. She didn't know. She was going to sacrifice herself for him. Yeah. The One of the last lines that we get uh, with this conversation between Sally and Poseidon is, you know, he says, when the time comes, I will be by his side. It's just not right now. I, I can't do that now and i think that's kind of powerful right it's like it does suck it's like you know at the end of the day you're a god you're part of the big three like maybe talk to zeus or something um but there's the promise that when it's needed he will be there so i'm gonna make sure i look out for that episode eight yeah maybe (laughs) well wink maybe (laughs) maybe he has helped him in as much ways as he can so far, he just hasn't showed his face. To I mean, he's been sending his water friend quite a few times, but yeah. not himself. Oh my God. What, he did try to wait for him, though. What did you think of Toby Stevenson's performance as Poseidon? You know, it, it was bizarrely human mm. in the sense that he brought such humanity and fatherly sort of tenderness and thought to the role. And, and, and again, I, I think I said this in the last episode, maybe the episode before it, that I'm always expecting them to come in in, you know, a flash of lightning, you know, and shoot water out of their eyeballs or something Mm -hmm. like that. But, you know, they really are just encompassing the human side of what it means to be a God. Yeah, I I think he he had a presence about him, right? It's like seems powerful, but like he had an accent. (laughs) I am mad that he wasn't like wearing like a Tommy Bahamas like shirt and like, you know, Bermuda shorts and like stuff like that, yeah. but like it's fine. <laughs> I'll let it go. <laughs> I guess you know if they were like uh, upstate New York, he might stick out if he's wearing a tropical print shirt or something, <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> but I just love the characterization in the books of like he's like a beach dude. Yeah, of course he's gonna look like that. <laughs> but fantastic performance. I'm very excited to see him again. I also want to see him interact with other gods and siblings and stuff like that. And I'm so excited for Percy. And him to meet. It's going to be a very interesting conversation because we've seen what Poseidon wanted to do and how he feels about Percy and Sally. But Percy doesn't know that. Right. He hardly ever got to talk about his dad in that way with his mom before she turned to gold. (laughs) Ouch. (laughs) I'm very curious to see if, um, you know, in the in the final chapters of the book, which I'm thinking is what's going to take place in the final episode of the season. When they do finally meet, it's a very quick scene that they have together. I'm wondering if they're going to give us a little more in the series. I guess we'll see. I'm excited to see that. I'm excited to go to Olympus. Um, At at the end of this episode, let's make our, like, what is, like, the thing we want to see in the finale. Mm. We'll do that. So, Underworld? To the Underworld. We're going to go to Underworld? We're going to go to the underworld. There's going to be dogs and tree people and a boat of other people. Tree people. <laughs> yeah, they're rooted. Yeah. They were scary. The, fantastic. They were very scary. Production design. Fantastic. Oh my God. Not the Asphodel. So good. <laughs> the fields of Asphodel. Ah! Okay. <laughs> the, I, let's talk about the look of the underworld. Um, not what I expected. No, same. Loved every second of it. Um, devoid of color. Mm-hmm. It's just there. It's kind of like neutral. It's there's not like, like no sunlight, no color, no life. Yeah. Literally, like there's no plants. It's just rock mm-hmm. and death and bone. And I really loved that. Like, I'm going to assume that like all the rocks there, because it was black, right? And that's what his palace is made out of. It's like obsidian, black yeah. obsidian. Oh, so good. It looked fantastic. <laughs> Black obsidian, baby. <laughs> Those that are watching this on YouTube, you just see Derek's face. <laughs> <laughs> it's concerning. <laughs> yeah. Caves. Moats and boats. <laughs> Skulls. <laughs> so good. I liked the, you know, when they got closer to Hades, how it looked more deserty, but like it wasn't like a warm 
desert, right? It was just like the sand was like off white and like it wasn't like a, a warm filter over it. You know what? It's just like all the life was sucked out of everything. Oh yeah, all the colors been drained okay, from we the world. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> What's the uh, scariest place you've ever been? Scariest place I've ever been. Yeah. Oh, um, maybe. <laughs> I went so uh, in upstate New York. There's house caverns, mm. and you can do so. Like, there's like a general tour that goes through the caverns, and it's like, hi, these are stalactites, these are stalagmites, but you can do a private tour where you have to put on a headlamp. And a big, like, white suit, and you crawl through the caverns down underneath. No. And they tell you to shut your lamp off at one point. No. And there's, ab- there's, it's a literal pitch black. There's an absolute void of light. Mm-hmm. It was crazy. I don't like that. See, like, I don't think I'm claustrophobic, but I might be a little. <laughs> Fair. Like, I, caves, I've gone caving before. But I always make sure that there's like space. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't do those like tiny, like if I have to be on my hands and knees in a cave, I'm, I'm dead. Like I'm going to die. Like I- <laughs> what's, what's the scariest place you've ever been? Mm, there was, so growing up, I was, my dad was in the military, so we moved around a lot and I, for a big chunk of my life, I grew up in El Paso mm. and the base there was Fort Bliss. And when we were there, we lived right near the hospital, which was like Beaumont and like the new base in between the other part of the base. There was old base, meaning it was completely abandoned. There was daycares, buildings, houses that they just left and they couldn't tear it down. This is what we were told. They couldn't tear it down because there was like asbestos and lead because it was so old Mm -hmm. that it would have cost more to like put a dome over it to tear it down than to just leave it. Also, it's El Paso. It's a desert, whatever. So us being kids, we would explore old base and our favorite place to go was the old daycare. When I tell you, it was so terrifying. Like there would be parts where it just kept going down complete darkness. Ooh. And like, there were still like high chairs there and like toys and literal, like you remember in the last of us when That's they go down I was to- thinking. It, it felt very much like that because they had stuff on the walls still. Mm-hmm. Oh, so scary. But we kept going back. <laughs> well, you were kids and you're were, you were getting high in the danger. Yeah. Okay. And I mean this like very seriously. It's going to sound really funny. Do you want to know what actually causes me like true anxiety? Mm-hmm. Trader Joe's on a Saturday. Yes. And I mean that so serious. You've seen it. Yeah. I, there are so many people everywhere. Like I actually... So in that sense, I think I'm claustrophobic. Like being in a tight space, I don't think necessarily bothers me, but being surrounded by too many people. (sighs) So Derek is going to amend his scariest place and put Trader Joe's on a Saturday. (laughs) Trader Joe's on a Saturday is so scary. It is a lot. Because you know what it is? Also, when I go to, we only go to Trader Joe's once every couple of months. Like six months. Yeah. It's like very rarely. So it's when, too I, far. when I go there, it's very far. And it's a lot of people. When, when I go there, I'm excited to like, look around. Yeah. I want to like, oh, what's this new thing? What's that new thing? Because they have so many seasonal things. People are there. They are like ravenous. Yeah. Animals. Mm-hmm. I don't like it. I don't like it either. Oh, it makes me feel horrible. I'm going to go next weekend. Yeah. I love Trader okay. Joe's. <laughs> I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's go back to possibly one of the scariest places that these kids. Oh, right, right. Not Trader Joe's. (laughs) Got it. I've been to. Um, So the line of people lining up to get judgment or get carried through the river sticks and all of that. I love that they were going through the line. Yeah. When it was like, it's, there's just a part, like a rope. That's just like, you could have maybe gone around. I don't know, but maybe not. Maybe like a monster would have come and got them. Um, the introduction of Cerberus. I love him. He's such a good boy. He's the Aww. best de- demonic boy he ever. He just wants scritches and to play. Yeah, he's misunderstood. I, yeah, absolutely. Totally misunderstood. When he, uh, when he, when Annabeth is scratching him and they lay down, I loved it when the, the head on the left went over the head in the middle. <gasps> it's so cute. It's so cute. I He's love just him. a big slobbery Rottweiler. He'll eat you. But 
But not for real. He's cute. I don't think so. I mean, is that his job? Yeah. He like, didn't you see, like, he called him and, you know, he was going to eat them. Yeah. That's his job. He's scary. I did like um, Charon saying, you're not dead. Yeah. <laughs> the lead up to that where like, it looks like he's either going to attack them or yell at them or sound super scary. And he's just like, mm, no. <laughs> Get out of here. It's so, yeah, you fool. so good. I don't know if you noticed, but on the top of his staff, there were like these two almost like screaming faces. It yes. was very cool. Oh, so good. The costume work on him. I want that. Like just to wear. It looks cool. Fun. Yeah. I mean, it, right. it looked like it could be comfortable. It's just oh, like yeah. a big flowy black okay. like, hood cloak. <gasps> yeah. Let's get into caftan, yeah. baby. <laughs> I'm pushing 40. My turquoise caftan years are almost upon us. <laughs> you have like one more year. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so we also get the answer in this episode when we found out that there was four pearls given. Mm. We all were kind of like, well, we all, all of us, you're included in this, listeners and watchers. And we do watch it together. Yeah. <laughs> Is the fourth pearl has to get disposed of somehow. Something has to happen. I didn't expect Grover to be eaten. Yes. When it happened. Yeah. Um, but him crawling out of the jowls of Cerberus was so good. That was so quick when he got eaten, too. Yeah, he was gone. We were just like, whoa. The behind the scenes for it is so funny because how they do that is they just yank him back <laughs> with stuff. And it's so funny to watch. <laughs> oh, but he, he's gone in a second. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I had written in my notes was, okay, cool. The pearl is now in Cerberus. Does Cerberus get to go outside? <laughs> so I like to think that things are done for a reason, uh-huh. you know, in, in shows. And so we had kind of had this thought of why are there four pearls? To me, the idea of having four pearls just for one to get lost seems like there has to be more to it than that. Mm. Personally, because you, that was a change from the book. Do, but do you think that was more of just like, not to give the thing like because i feel like in the book and like when i was reading the book i was like oh percy is just gonna like hold on to his mom and do it and they'll both go or like something i don't know how the pearls work right i feel like if in the show they were like here's only three you know what i mean because like the sea spirit gave it to him so like why would the sea spirit knowingly give him less Mm, i see you know what I mean? She's like, oh, sorry. I can only like harvest three. Good luck saving your mom. <laughs> <laughs> they may be very hard to like, come by. She can only get three. Yeah. You know, and I think maybe a point of this possibly was to just show how easy they are to lose. Well, <laughs> that, but also just had a kind of kind and understanding Percy can be mm-hmm. right. Cause Grover comes out. He's very apologetic. Like in my head, I'd be like, okay, so. I guess you have to stay here because I'm saving my mom. Yeah. <laughs> right? Derek is like, you go back into service and you get your pearl. Or, sorry, you stay here, get in line. You wait <laughs> until that dog poops and then you dig through that poop and yeah. you get that pearl. <laughs> I mean, also maybe not the wrong choice. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it passes. No, but I, I think that's a good point because Percy, in the Vegas episode, when, you know, delirious... Grover is like, are we late because of me? Technically, yeah, but he doesn't tell him. Mm -hmm. And so this is Percy protecting his friend in the best way he knows how. But also like, what do you think? He didn't want to get eaten by Cerberus, right? So Mm -hmm. like, I'm glad that Percy has that level headedness to be like, I understand. It's fine. We'll figure it out. Like, yeah, I'll stay behind. It's okay. Someone like Clarice, on the other hand, (laughs) might have literally murdered him on the spot. Early, yeah, Clarice this season, 100% would mm-hmm. probably just like, just we're fine. Seething from her staff <laughs> being broken, just still. Gonna, just gonna <laughs> electrocute you, impale you. <laughs> the fields of Astrodel, oh my God. So good. The fact of the spirits getting rooted in place because of their regrets mm-hmm. is just a terrifying and fantastic thing that happens. Why do you think? Annabeth was getting rooted. I literally was going to ask you that question. I got that first. Then we'll sit in silence. I I think (laughs) it's one of those things where it's like, we don't know yet. I think 
personally, mm. I think she blames herself for Talia. Oh, good point. I think that's something that weighs on her conscience that because of her, Dahlia had to protect her and then got turned into the tree. So you're thinking it has to do with Luke and Dahlia. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, in this, in this podcast and because we did the first book, we don't want to spoil the rest of the story. Right. Um, but I think if we're thinking that way, that's what I could think of it, you know, cause the only other thing I could think of is like, she recently kind of changed her perspective on the gods and like demigods because of Percy. But like, I don't know why she would regret that, Mm -hmm. you know? And I have to admit now, Noah has literally, he's just finished listening to the first, the the first five books. Yeah. I redid it and I'm fresh. It's all fresh. in my head. So I, I don't know if I've given anything away, but I have read these books 15, 20 years ago. I don't remember any of those sorts of details. Yeah. So, if I, I mean, I don't mean to spoil anything if I did. No, no, oh, no, okay. no, no. Because I mean, I think it's not spoiling anything with, we know Thalia is in the tree, mm-hmm. right? And we knew that Annabeth was going to camp and Thalia is in mm-hmm. the tree mm-hmm. and she's not. Yeah. So that's, not. that's where my line of thinking yeah. was. So I would, I would say if I had to guess of like what she was regretting, it's probably something to do with that choice that happened. And I think that Annabeth really sees herself as a problem solver and a people saver. And so in that instance, she couldn't do that. Yeah. Well, and that might stay with her. So good. Them running from Cerberus in there. And then when they, when she had to tell them, I'll use the pearl, you have to go. Like, mm-hmm. trust me. And they run and then you see that pop of light. So, so good. And it's just that thing of Grover being like, she's okay. She made it. That was it. Hopefully. Yeah. It wasn't Cerberus that's pearl popped, you know? <laughs> right. What if it was? That would be hilarious. Actually. It's just Cerberus is like, oh. uh, <laughs> am I at Venice Beach? I need to see Cerberus on the beach. Oh, it'd be so good. Running after a Frisbee. There just is. so happy. This is more for the people that know the story, but we haven't seen many hellhounds. And there is a hellhound that's in the book that plays a huge role main, named Mrs. O'Leary. Mm. Um, and if it's anything like how it's going to look with Cerberus, I'm just very excited for that. Um, I need a, a dog friend. It's yeah, yeah. really cool. Please. I, I can't wait for that. So we, we need to see if this pearl is going to come back or maybe not. Maybe it's just that stomach it. is just, yeah. Maybe his stomach just gets teleported. <laughs> some acid. Acid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So they're making their way to Hades. Right. But before we get to the palace, which is like an inverted, amazing, didn't expect Such that. Such a cool idea. Love it. Yeah. How does it work? Don't care. <laughs> Mama, it's the underworld, baby. <laughs> there, you can't ask the questions because they won't be answered. Yeah, we get the pit of Tartarus. Mm. I loved the detail of sand being around it because what are you going to hold on to? Mm-hmm. Nothing. You're just that that done. entire scene that was like straight from the book. Mm-hmm. That entire thing, and and I remember I was just watching it, feeling like. Oh, yes, this is it. This is exactly how I pictured it. As soon as you see that pit, you're like, good luck, Percy. Or, and then good Grover's luck, just like taking <laughs> off. He's just like, ah. yeah. so good. I loved that. I like the way it looked because it like it massive one. It's gigantic. The mm. pit of Tartarus. But like, it's just there. You know what I mean? It's like there's no warning that it's going to be right there. But it's yeah. like. That's hell. Like the underworld isn't hell, right? It's not the like the Christian form of hell that we think of. It's the underworld. Mm-hmm. So like Arteris is like, that's down. Mm-hmm. That's like done. Big bad. <laughs> the deep down. Big, big bad. Oh. Hades. Should we talk about Hades? Hades. Well, let's also just stop and say that they finally do uncover the master bolt. Dear God. <laughs> <laughs> the point of the quest i forgot the Maybe old I'm blue just, backpack i'm just so used to it i'm just like yeah the master bolt's there anyway hades also i think noah has a little crush on hades so he just can't wait to talk about him. <laughs> i didn't say that but i think you do i mean like, oh my god we'll send him a valentine fine the eyebrows are so cool <laughs> <laughs> And okay, the master bolt. I love that when like Percy fell back and it was the backpack, they were both like, What was that? I thought it was a pearl. I was like, oh, now they have one. Imagine if he disappeared. <laughs> no, just the backpack. Oh, no. <laughs> just gone. So the master bolt is in the backpack that Ares gave Percy. Mm. So the plot thickens. 
confusing, right? Mm-hmm. They all assume that Hades has the master role because he also has Percy's mom. But why would the bag that Ares gave me all of a sudden master role came out? <sighs> That's good storytelling mm-hmm. because this whole time, and I, I, I love the perception of things. They told us the beginning in the story. Sally told us not all monsters are monsters. Not all heroes are heroes. You assume Hades is bad. I mean, he's not great. He's manipulative and it's Hades, but like he didn't steal it. Mm -mm. It's not him. Nope. So how did Ares get it? And who gave it to Ares? (gasps) Plot twist. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Now Hades. There you go. Okay. Now Hades. Um, When they get into this black obsidian palace of luxury i love when they're going up the lift and this is my favorite line from grover in this episode also it's his one-liner and he's like is this our stop (laughs) because there's nothing there (laughs) and nobody (laughs) no i i mean these kids have no idea what they're ever walking into but walking into an upside down obsidian palace and having the floor just lift them it's got to be guards that made no noise yes. just like followed them as they walked <gasps> oh. and then little tiny Hades from all the way in the back of the room comes clip clopping along from behind the throne <laughs> he's just like comes out he's like hi guys hey I've been waiting for you <laughs> there is so much charisma and like manipulation and like I don't know just this kind of like smoothness with him mm-hmm. oh I really liked it yeah and so he well, first he offers them something delightful to drink, uh, but then he leads them to his, uh, I don't know, den, smoking room behind the, the, the throne office. I love that he wasn't on the throne when they got there. He literally has like this and he's not in all black, right? Or no. it's not fiery red. It's like he has like emerald green, mm-hmm. amazing color. And black, but it's like a smoker's jacket mm-hmm. and he's like in slippers and he's like, Hi. he's giving very <laughs> Hugh Hefner vibes, yeah. you know? And then I like when they, when they come around the bend to that area, he's folding a blanket. Mm. He's like very domestic. Yeah. He's like, I'm just going to clean up. I have guests over. He's currently decorated. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that he placed Sally Jackson. She's like, she'd look great right there. Yeah. He's like this. So this is the centerpiece of the room. <laughs> The room needs to work with the Sally statue. (laughs) She ties it all together. She really does. She really brings it all together. So one of the the big changes that I wanted to talk about the book, the only thing, if I had to do a critique of this entire episode, was I was so excited to see his skeleton army and guards and like different eras of like soldiers and stuff that died. There was nobody there. I liked the change because it really went with the underworld right it Mm -hmm. went with just deprived of life and like not really there it didn't seem overcrowded like you get the feeling in the book yeah it seemed more desolate which is just as terrifying yeah it's like either trader joe's or like nothing (laughs) and where and so if it is desolate where is everyone where are all the spirits yeah what happens to them? Yeah, Elysium is mm. like, that is interesting. We didn't get to see like Elysium or anything like that. Yeah. Mm. Where it looked like sort of like a, wasn't it like an airport security line or something like, like that? Like a TSA check-in. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. There's like the easy death line and then like the ones yeah. where you judged. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was very quick. Yeah. So, but what did you think of Jay Duplass as Hades? Fantastic. You know, I, I, like I said earlier, I think the series, because they think Hades took it right. They build him up to be this really bad guy. And at this moment, there's really nothing to be like, he's bad. Like he is holding his mom hostage, (laughs) you know, which is like, whatever, because he thought they stole. I'm like for a reason. Yeah. (laughs) Cause they thought he stole his home. So like fair. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's fair for, I think a God to do. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to take something that you took, you took for me. Like let's, you know. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that this is, You know, I feel like there's a lot of discourse around Hades in Greek mythology, and this feels a little more true to, like, what Hades fans would want to see. He's not always like, yeah, I'm going to get them. He's like, I live down here. Right. I take care of this realm. He's also a god. You know what? He is a god of his realm, right? So Mm -hmm. it's like, they're not necessarily, like, I mean, the gods suck, but, like, he isn't the monster that 
the series was building him up to be. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like a misleading thing because Mm -hmm. again, he's charismatic and he seems kind of like, I don't know, like cool. Do you know what I mean? I'd have a drink with him. Yeah. I mean, it seemed like he wanted to, he was like waiting to hang out. I bet he likes really (laughs) bad reality TV. That would Like he must get such joy from when the real housewives are fighting. (laughs) The real housewives of the underworld. Yes. (laughs) Yes, it's just Electo and her sister, uh-huh. and they're just <laughs> furious all like, the time. Yeah, <gasps> I would love that. Make it happen. Make it happen. Oh my god, spinoff Percy Jackson, the spinoff Real Housewives of the Underworld. <laughs> yeah, and then who's um who's is it Persephone that has to spend half her life with well, his wife? Oh, isn't Who, that his wife? I don't know. Shame on me. I don't know. There's a Greek, co- but in my mind. In this Real Housewives cast, she is there and she's like, I don't even want to be here. I have to be here. And I have to listen to these harpies scream all day. <laughs> Who do you think would host the Real Housewives of the Underworld? Andy Cohen. No. <laughs> <laughs> you think that he has an all-access pass to the Underworld? He owns the rights to the show. He, he, I mean, he's a Hollywood producer. Of course, he's been to the Underworld. Yeah. But I'm... Like ninety eight percent sure that Persephone is Hades' wife. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I will say again. I'm sorry. I'm going to get back to the book. Those that listen to the book or the audio book, Persephone does come in later mm-hmm. in the in the series. Um, and because of her her myth and everything, the way they do her voice is insane. She's like, "Mother, I don't want to do this," and it's like, Bleh. "That is so wild." Because you have to think like, right, they put these gods in the Western world and a lot of it is like Long Island and like Jersey and stuff like that. So you have people that talk like this. It's like, what? My my mom. Yeah. <laughs> Joni. Dad. Dad. <laughs> uh, but so good. Yeah. So um, Andy Cohen hosting the, the inter-realm <laughs> edition. Of- yeah. So good. Oh, my God. So back to their conversation, right? So. Manipulation was still happening, mm-hmm. right? And he assumes that Percy and Grover and all of them took his helm, which Percy was like, uh, I don't even know what that is. So no, I didn't take it. But like, you also can't have the master bowl. And I love that Hades was like, why would I steal? I don't want that. Like me? I seldom cahoot yeah. <laughs> was a line, an exact line with, that I loved. <laughs> cahoot. <laughs> Who am I in cahoots with? Yeah. I seldom cahoot. Yeah. <laughs> they, um, when they finally kind of come to common ground with this, right? It's like, Percy has to make the decision. He's like, we have two pearls. He's telling me to ask for sanctuary, which means that he'll protect him, especially for war is coming. Because Percy puts together, you weren't who I was seeing. Kronos has to be behind all of this, which is like that they like mention Kronos mm-hmm. already. Um, but you can kind of see when he mentions that name, Hades was kind of like, no, 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 don't say that. No, no, I could also, him are you saying like, you're saying Kronos is going to be coming. Okay. Ask for sanctuary because I'll protect you. Mm-hmm. But give me the master bolt now because I need it, which it seems very like, I don't know if I trust that. I also think that Percy is, he's sort of done being a pawn in these godly plans. Right. And so to give the God, to give Hades more power would just demote him to that feeling again. And also his mom is still just a, a gold sickle. Very much a gold sickle, just like he was a few episodes ago. Oh my God. God's uh, the oh so that now he has like an understanding of probably what she's going through because <gasps> he didn't look like he liked that and he still has to leave her yeah him saying to Hades all I can ask all I can do is ask for you to do the right thing and he trusts that I'm gonna go get your helm I'm gonna get the master ball back you'll release my mom you have to do the right thing and he leaves Percy, but I think it all still goes back to what his mom is teaching him this whole time. Trust yourself, trust other people and hope that they do the right thing. There is good in people. Let's see if Hades um, says, he, you know, is good on his promise. He didn't make him swear on the river sticks. Just saying. Just saying it ain't binding. Mm-mm. It ain't binding. No, not at all. 
him saying to his mom, hold fast, mom. Oh, baller. Yeah. Baller He's like, line. Uh, I have to go like fight some gods. I'll be back. <laughs> yes. I promise. So good. This writing, the callbacks in this writing, in this show, love it. Mm-hmm. I love every second of it. So good. It's very good because they set it up. They knew. That line, hold fast. Oh, my God. Love it. He takes his pearl. Bam. Back to the surface and um, Aries is there. And Annabeth. I love how Annabeth was like, <laughs> I wonder how long like Aries was just staring at her. Like <laughs> She's just like, <laughs> what's up, bruh? She's probably like, they might be back. Maybe she just had her, you know what? Maybe she just had her cap on. Mm, that was good probably, point. Yeah, she might have done that. Maybe she saw and was like, yeah, nope, I'm out. I'm just gonna wait. <laughs> right here. Bye. <laughs> oh, very good episode. So far, from what we can talk about, favorite episode out of all of them. I loved it. I love the aesthetic of the underworld. Um, Hades, fantastic. Loved him. Hades is one of my favorite like Greek characters because I always think his characterization is really interesting because he's mm-hmm. not always necessarily evil and he's kind of sad most of the time, right? It's like his stories are kind of like, oh, like it, it would kind of suck to just be around that all the time and yeah. monsters and demons like that does suck. You know, but you get what you get. Get get and don't get upset. <laughs> I do think it was a very good episode. And like I said, at the top of our episode, I think it added a lot more to a lot of the relationships here. Um, Even between, I think, Percy, Annabeth, and Grover. You know, with Annabeth in the forest, we see that she has regrets. Uh, With with Percy and Grover, we see that Percy, again, is willing to forgive a friend for an honest mistake. Um, And then for Percy himself to see what he had to go through with his mom to promise he would never leave her, but then ultimately have to leave her. Ugh. So, you know, we have these three characters here who are going through a lot and are just figuring out that they've been kind of fooled this yeah. entire time. Yeah. Um, finale mm-hmm. this is next week. What are you excited for? Like what? Actually, here's a better question. Do you think there's going to be a massive cliff- cliffhanger at the end so that they were like, people are going to really want a season two, even though like it's the most viewed show they've done in a long time? Or do you think it's going to be like very book endy? I don't, I think we're going to get the book endy part where this first part is tied up, right? With the master bolt and the helm. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to get a glimpse of maybe what's going on in the pit or a glimpse of Kronos to show the big bad. Yes. To show the big Mm -hmm. bad and being like, (laughs) but. (laughs) Percy <laughs> doesn't know what's coming for him. Ha, 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 ha. Right, right. And then we're all like, no. Yeah. I think that's the kind of cliffhanger we're going to get. Yeah. I, I like it when stories like really book end the main point of that book or story um, and then set it up for a thing. They're yeah. like, oh, the curtain's not drawn yet. And then something yeah. happens. Or maybe we'll see a little Cyclops or something like that. Tyson? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. I'm so excited for Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers. No spoilers. No spoilers. No spoilers. Who's no. Tyson? I don't know. I know. I know quite a few people that have like read the first book because of the episodes we've done, and I'm like, I know they haven't started the next one, and I know they listen. So because of you guys, I'm not going to spoil or anything. But Tyson, I love you. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> I love Tyson. So last episode's coming. Very excited. I think that they're going to like Aries and Percy are going to fight for like the first 10 minutes and then we have like all the ending stuff we have to go cross country again you have to go cross country he has to get to olympus somehow to yeah. get the bolt so yeah. man gonna meet zeus oh my god some things are gonna happen gonna meet his dad gonna meet his dad i'm very excited to see olympus because we saw tiny little glimpses right we saw the thrones but and we saw kind of the general look of it but mm. i really want to get a good look yeah at what olympus yeah. looks like i'm excited mm. i can't <sighs> believe it we're going to be done. I know. We're going to be done. We've been doing Percy Jackson for 12 weeks. Yeah. Hi. Wow. And it's wow. funny. The That's last three months. Yeah. The last episode. And then we have like Argyle stuff. So like if you're if you made it this far in this episode and you just started listening to us, Percy Jackson, we do jump from thing to thing quite a bit because the beginning of our podcast is our, our current, current favorite, favorite pop culture, culture obsession. obsession. So this is current. And our next obsession is going to change. 
So stay tuned for that. We're just <gasps> rock and rolling, baby. Oh my God. So finale next week. Let's go. I'm Let's so go. So sad, but I'm so excited. Episode eight. I'm going to miss these people. Mm. I'm going to miss them. When's the next season fucking coming out? Disney. <laughs> Disney. Where, oh, you know what I was thinking? What? Isn't there like a rumor or something that they're going to be making like a Percy Jackson part of like a Disney park or something like that? There is a rumor. I know that there is a Camp Half-Blood mm, thing that popped up not too long ago. Um I know Be- Becky Riordan had shared it on socials. Like there is something that already exists. Ah, but I did hear a rumor. Who knows if this is true that they're going to add it to the American ones. Uh-huh. And I think it might just be like if the series does really well. Well, I think they should because I think that there is some really great opportunities for some fun food. Ooh. Like picture like white chocolate truffles or the pearls, and you can have the different nectars Blue food. and. Yeah, blue food. Yeah. I think they would have a lot of fun. Ooh, get sorted into your cabin. Yes. Get claimed by your godly parent. Oh, uh, we already know ours. Our Patreon episode did that. We yeah. did that. So, Patreon. Go you want to find out. Become an ABOP, baby. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, next week finale. Very excited. We'll see you then, folks. Bye-bye. Bye.